Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as Are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, Why do viruses go latent or hidden or ineffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, So there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, We're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be your goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now a part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest, Paul Davies. He's an author, a professor at Arizona State University. Uh, Currently, he's over in Australia uh, doing some work there. Uh, Paul, the... um, He's not only a theoretical physicist and a cosmologist and an astrobiologist, he's also a best-selling science author. He's published 30 books and hundreds of research paper across various fields. But I'm having him back today because he's also uh, working on cancer, and he has some very unique insights into it. So I wanted him to be a part of the cancer book as a co-contributor. So, Paul, thanks for coming. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Yeah. So if you would, just tell me a little bit about your background, how you, you know, from working in physics, how did you start thinking about cancer and why are you aware of it and working on it as well? That's a very pertinent question. It does seem a bit bizarre and people are always intrigued to know how does a theoretical physicist and cosmologist become involved in cancer research. And it all happened because out of the blue, about uh, 14 years ago, I think it was, Anna Barker, who at that time was the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute, just hit the telephone and she said, well, you don't know me, but I know about your center, the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University, and you are dedicated to rethinking the conceptual foundation of tough scientific problems. And cancer is a tough problem. We're spending $5 billion worth of taxpayer money each year, and progress is painfully slow. Can physicists help? And I said, well, uh, I'm sure physicists can help, but I know nothing about it. She said, well, it doesn't matter. And then that began an incredible learning curve. So I helped uh, Dr. Barker set up a national program, uh, which became uh, known as Physical Science Oncology Centers. There were 11 of them around the country. And I ran the one at Arizona State University, and they were dedicated to basically uh, looking for new ways of thinking about cancer by bringing in physical scientists, not just physicists, but chemists, mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, just to see if we could make progress with cancer uh, by thinking about it in a different way. And I took that seriously. And so in addition to running uh, this center, we had about 30 people in total. A lot of the research projects were fairly mainstream. But in addition to administering that, I developed my own theory of cancer in collaboration with a number of people around the world. And that remains my principal involvement today. All right. So now for the uh, 
the questions, a lot of people seem to postulate that, you know, random mutation occurs in some of our cells and that leads to, you know, other genes being turned on and off and, and changes and uh, proliferation and cancer. What are your thoughts on how cancer starts? What are some of the different ways in which you postulate that it starts? Well, I come at this from a very different point of view. See, I came in cold and I thought, well, how do I think about this one? Cancer is immensely complex, isn't it? But the job of a cosmologist and generally a theoretical physicist is to uh, look through the complexity and try to boil things down to the deep uh, underlying principles. And it seemed to me that uh, cancer, on the one hand, it looks a very complicated sort of thing and every patient is different. On the other hand, it does look very systematic and highly organized. It's almost as if as cancer begins and develops, there's a sort of blueprint or plan of action that is followed by most cancers in most organs and in most organisms. But the big insight I had was sitting having a beer one Saturday and I read a paper in the journal Nature about cancer genes being found in coral that have been dated uh, 600 million years uh, ago, their lineage, going back 600 million years. And I thought, well, you know, cancer is obviously a very ancient disease. It's something associated with very old genes. And I began to develop this idea further and came around to the point of view that cancer really is a type of reversion or throwback to a more primitive life. And in particular, uh, to something that predates full multicellularity. And so let me just uh, give a bit of background on that. The, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. For at least three and a half billion, there's been life on it. But for most of that time, it was just single cells, just unicellular life. And when you think about it, uh, single cell organisms, for example, bacteria, are effectively immortal because they can just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. Uh, but then uh, sometime between about one and a half billion years ago and a billion years ago, a whole different way of doing life. Uh, then evolve. Uh, this is multicellularity. And a multicelled organism does the whole life project very differently. So, for example, there's still a vestige of the immortality that's in our genes, which get passed on from one generation to the next in the germ line of eggs and sperm. Uh, but the individual cells of our body are not immortal. So skin cells, liver cells, kidney cells, and so on, they, they get a fair old go they can uh, last and they can replicate and we have stem cells that replenish them. But sooner or later, they these cells have to die. It's a process called apoptosis. It's a self-inflicted, uh, it's a sort of suicidal program. And um, that's the deal in multicellularity, a contract between the germline, which says we will bear the heavy lifting for immortality, and the somatic cells, the rest of the cells in your body, pay the price of apoptosis. And it's obviously a very successful way of doing life because there are many multicelled organisms on the planet. But of course, it, it comes at a price. Any sort of cooperative contract uh, with a, a large number of components has to be policed. Otherwise, uh, there's always a possibility of cheating. And uh, when somatic cells, such as ordinary cells in your body, cheat, basically, uh, when they take the, the organization of the organism to their advantage, but they don't pay the price of apoptosis. That's cancer. It's a breakdown of that ancient, which was struck over a billion years ago, uh, between the collective of the cells in the body and, uh, the, and the germline. And so cancer really is a, a result of a sort of reversion, a bid back to the good old days of unicellular immortality. And so in a nutshell, so you... that's what it's about. Do you think in any population of cells, there's always rogue ones? And I guess if the rogue ones are able to gain enough voice share that they take over that localized tissue? Yes, I think you've, you've got that about right, because I mentioned that the cooperation between the somatic cells and the germline requires a sort of uh, policing. It, um, like all organizations in which there are many people playing a part, um, to avoid cheating, you need to have uh, regulations. And there's layer upon layer of regulatory arrangement uh, in a complex organism like a human being. There are many, many layers. And one of these layers uh, is that if an individual cell decides to make this bid for immortality, it becomes cancerous. Well, there are a number of mechanisms that can take it out. Uh, there's the immune system for a start. Uh, there's the 
tissue microenvironment, which can suppress the uh, formation of, of small tumors. Um, a whole host of, of ways in which the body can remain healthy. And I bet for somebody of my age, uh, I'm absolutely riddled with uh, wannabe cancer cells, uh, which yeah. are being held in check, one hopes, uh, by the, um, the tissue microenvironment in the body in general. And when people present with cancer, with clinical symptoms, what's happened is that somehow those layers of defense have become overwhelmed and the cancer has gained the upper hand. And then we, we say, well, somebody's got cancer, but of course they've had it all along. I mean, it's uh, roots within the organism probably go back quite a long time, but it doesn't manifest until that balance is tip. Do you think that uh, unicellular organisms can get cancer? It doesn't even make sense to say that. And what about uh, prokaryotes versus eukaryotes? Uh, I've often asked my uh, cancer colleagues, that, uh, is there anything like cancer in, for example, yeast cells? So these are, are complex uh, unicellular organisms. And sometimes people say, well, there are some sort of cancer-like features that can arise. But for me, the, the telling fact is when you do, uh, you look across all multi-celled species, so we're talking all mammals, birds, fish, insects, plants, corals, fungi, and so on, there's, there's cancer or cancer-like phenomena in almost all of them. And I have colleagues at Arizona State University uh, whose research project is to look at cancer, for example, you know, in elephants, naked mole rats, or, or whatever it is, and to compare how these, these different uh, species get on in the face of it's clear it's very pervasive. And when you see something that's right across the tree of life, you suspect it has very deep evolutionary roots. So again, one is led from this almost um, ubiquity, this pervasive nature, back to a billion years ago to uh, when the multicell body, body plans were being laid down. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. That's really when it kicks in. And the astonishing thing is that although that was a hunch uh, a dozen years ago when I first uh, dreamt that idea up, uh, it's since been tested using a very precise technique, which goes by the rather frightening name of phylostratigraphy. And what phylostratigraphy does, um, it does for genes what uh, stratigraphy does for geology. So if you go to the Grand Canyon and you look out, you see all these layers going all the way down millions and millions of years, and that tells you something about the past. Well, you can do the same for genes. You can uncover those layers, the ages. You can find the old genes and the more recently evolved genes. So it's a statistical thing. It uh, requires some fairly sophisticated computation. But it has been done, and it's a major process. And so if you give me your favorite cancer gene, my colleagues can figure out how old it is. And sure enough, there's a big cluster of cancer genes round about between one and a half billion years and a billion years ago when multicellular was evolving. So uh, that's the smoking gun. The genes can be dated to precisely that period that we hypothesize. And then there's another cluster of genes which are even older. Actually, some, some cancer genes go back over 3 billion years because they really are the genes that set the fundamental parameters of life as we know it. Going wrong, that's what, what happened. So the cancer is oh, a very okay. deeply embedded phenomenon. It's not just some sort of recent thing that was embedded in the very logic of life. Itself. But why, why would these genes arise in the first place? It seems like there would be a need for a de-differentiation to try to follow another you know, adaptive path when confronted with extreme conditions, like, you know, let's say uh, a microbe that's aerobic. And for some reason, I get into an environment that's becoming more and more anaerobic and I'm trying to adapt and it's not working. And, you know, my fellow microbes are dying. Uh, perhaps there's a way where this pathway, this new pathway is turned on or I can turn it on 
And even though it's very detrimental to me, it allows me to do differentiate and then take a new path to adapt. Right. Right. So raise a number of interesting issues there. One of which is why hasn't the evolution eliminated these cancer genes if they kill us? Uh, and the answer is that all the genes uh, involved in cancer, whether it's uh, cancer promotion or cancer suppression, are all genes which have regular functions in healthy organisms. So these aren't things you can just throw away. A lot of the genes are associated with development, particularly the early, early stages of development. Some of them are connected with wound healing. And when you think about these two processes, uh, they have a, a lot of things in common with uh, tumours. It's sometimes said that a tumour is like an embryo gone wrong, uh, because in embryos, the cells rapidly uh, proliferate. They move around in a very mobile sort of way. And they survive in a low oxygen environment. All things, all hallmarks of, of cancer. So uh, we're sort of stuck with cancer because we're stuck with the genes which are foundational, uh, not, not uh, recently evolved ones, foundational, which simply can't be eliminated. So we think of cancer as being a little like running the clock backward, uh, but at high speed. You mentioned about cell differentiation, and that's true. So when we think of bacteria, they, all the cells are alike, but take a multi-celled organism, you have different tissue types. It all starts out as the same cells sort of unipotent, as they're called. And then they see, you get these stem cells, which can then differentiate into different types of other cells. And cancer runs out backwards. It takes a cell which is uh, di fully differentiated and it goes sort of back up to become more like a stem cell. And um, in terms of looking at the evolutionary history, that's going back to cells as they were uh, over a billion years ago. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. So it's running that arrow backward. But you also raised another point, which is that, that life can retain buried within its genome uh, the ability to adapt to different circumstances. That is, it can, t it can remember uh, past challenges and turn on the necessary genetic equipment to deal with uh, whatever might be going on today. And I think this goes to the heart of what triggers cancer in the first place, because you mentioned in your introduction the standard somatic mutation theory, which says the cancer is a product of genetic damage, and that's the usual sort of thing. And I've never been convinced of that because it's a little bit like saying, well, supposing I've got, uh, you know, uh, an almost burnt out old Ford car, uh, and I lift the hood and I take a sledgehammer to the engine and just smash it around at random, and suddenly it's turned into a Ferrari. I mean, generally speaking, if you do random damage, uh, to something, it's not going to improve its performance. And so in, in my view, what is happening with cancer is that a cell might find itself in a poor environment. It might be a carcinogen in the tissues. It might be low oxygen. Uh, it's a poor tissue environment with low oxygen and other chemicals that healthy cells need. Um, it's, uh, it could be electrical effects. It could be wounding effects, mechanical effects. There could be a number of things. And the cell would think to itself, aha, I've got a problem here, but I remember the solution. And part of that repertoire of activity is to revert to what it used to do. Right. And including in that reversion is turning up the rate of mutation, because you're quite right that bacteria in a bad place can evolve solutions to that by turning up their own rate of mutation. They can tune them. Well, and can you call it, are they, are they turning up their rate of mutation or they're turning up their adaptation ability. I mean, it's a mutation sounds like it's really not as, you know, within the control or purview of bacteria or human cells or whatever it may be. But again, why would that machinery be there? And it must be being used by the cell in order to adapt. Because uh, so oh. far, I guess there's been maladaptation. So I, I think it would be a deliberate adaptation instead of a mutation. Well, yeah, you're, you're right, of course, that there can be pathways which are simply uh, suppressed in normal circumstances. Genes, of course, people talk about them. Um, they're not just sitting there turned on. Genes are mostly turned off uh, and they get turned on when appropriate. And so developmental genes, for example, they do their bit in early stage embryogenesis. Then they get silent. And if something affects them and they spring back into life, so to speak, then cancer results. So organisms retain within them the option of um, expressing certain pathways or suppressing those pathways. And sometimes these pathways are very ancient. And there's this term atavism. Atavisms are well known to biologists. This is where 
you suddenly get a um, famous example is supernumerary numerary nipple. Uh, humans had two nipples, uh, but of course, many of our ancestors had more nipples. And sometimes uh, people are born with an additional nipple. Uh, there are examples of uh, human babies with tails because our ancestors used to have tails and so on. And that's because the pathways of development uh, are uh, still there, but they're normally suppressed. And then if something goes a bit wrong, they can be expert. And so that is an example of, um, you know, a latent ability to, to deal with a problem. And I already mentioned a similar one, which is wound healing, uh, that organisms have the ability to spring into action and uh, generate lots of cells, and patch, patch up the wound. And sometimes cancer is described as the wound that never heals. And so that's, again, expressing that latent ability. But I must just um, complete this uh, by, by saying that there certainly are genes that allow tuning of the mutation. And bacteria do this and have done its very ancient response to stress, that if they're starving, for example, uh, they can uh, deliberately elevate their mutation rate to look for other things to metabolize. It's often called an SOS response. And what my co-workers at Arizona State University found is that uh, when you look at uh, the uh, genes in the human genome older than about a, a billion years, and you ask, well, what are they good for? One major class of those genes is they are homologues. That means they're you know, just like the human equivalent of the SOS genes in bacteria. In other words, uh, when bacteria turn up their mutation rate to solve problems, uh, the same genes are present in human cells and they can be turned up uh, to solve problems as well. And that's what cancer does. It expresses these genes, it elevates its own mutation rate. So a lot of that high mutation, which is seen in cancer, is not due to the, the damaging environment, radiation or something. It's actually self-inflicted. And this is so, the cancer cell looking for a solution. Okay, so would you say that a cancer is an organism that is, you know, it's, it's looking out for its own interests, it's going for its own homeostatic equipoise, it's acquiring its own resources. It's, you know, I, I, if so, at what point, you know, is one cancer cell an organism is a hundred, is a thousand, is a million? Like, at what point do you think this uh, separate identity arises? and therefore the drive to preserve itself and to proliferate and everything? This is a really excellent question, which we zeroed in on uh, during the time it was a five-year period that I was running oncology center. Uh, and I had um, a, a colleague who was a theoretical physicist, who, Tim Newman, who was particularly interested in this because, so he had the idea that a cluster of about 50 cells was about the maximum that you could have and remain in equilibrium. And that had something to do with just the geometry, the number of cells on the surface that could be uh, picked off by the, say, the immune system versus the proliferation rate. And one or two strands of evidence uh, led him to believe that that would be a typical cluster. And uh, he applied for a research grant uh, to see whether autopsies of road accident victims could be carried out to see whether their tissues had these sorts of microtumors lurking within them and stabilize. And uh, I'm afraid that work was never completed. It just didn't get funded. And uh, and so we're still very much in the dark. You see, the, the problem about cancer is, of course, people get sick, and that's, they go to a, a doctor, and, and so they've got clinical symptoms. And so you're studying people for whom the cancer has already uh, gone beyond the tipping point. What we really like to do is understand what is cancer doing, what are these microtumors doing in healthy individuals, where it's being held in check very hard, mm. particularly if they're small. But, you know, if you've got a, a lump that you can feel, it's a different matter. But if you're talking about 50 cells, you can't just go around cutting people open uh, looking for these microtumors. But I sort of suspect this is a very important part of the story and a big gap in the yeah. story as we currently understand it. Well, I've spoken to researchers that said they'll take cancer cells from one mouse and put them into another. And I asked them how many are needed to successfully, you know, cancerized the new mouse and they said uh, i believe it was hundreds of thousands or millions i don't know if they tried it with just one or two cells or a handful but it does seem to say that it takes a lot of cells in order to you know to sicken someone and for a cancer to take hold well uh, i think it very much depends on the tissue micro so for example 
if you have a healthy tissue and you just put uh, a single cancer cell in it, it won't progress. It'll be normalized. It, its phenotype will become normal, even though its genotype okay, is cancerous. The other experiment that's been done is you take um, a cancer, the nucleus of a cancer cell, and put it in a healthy cell. And again, it, uh, the phenotype is uh, normal. And you can even put a cancer nucleus in the uh, egg cell of the with frogs, and they will develop almost normally. So in other words, uh, cancer is about what gets expressed, uh, not, not the genome. And so this is the old uh, tussle between how much is uh, genetics and how much is environment. Big part of the cancer story is the environment. So the healthy tissue, you could probably sustain a, a really large number of, of cells. But conversely, if you've got a very poor tissue, or if it's a tissue in which there is already cancer establishing, uh, then even healthy cells tend to turn into cancer cells. In other words, it's sort of recruitment. And it depends on the level of the, uh, the how normal the tissues are. And there's probably going to be a spectrum. Mm. Uh, so you think uh, they're... they're... Yeah, that is a question. So again, with kind of standard models that begins with one cell and that cell divides and divides and divides and constitutes the whole tumor. But since the, since cells had these ancient genes that they can turn on, that would mean every cell has, them, at least within a given tissue, because yeah. some of them will turn cancerous. So I would think it's a consistent, persistent stress, metabolic, I mean, you know, or otherwise that causes a group of cells again to adapt, 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 and then they come to a dead end and they have to turn on this, this, uh, I guess, higher level pathway or more fundamental pathway and now they're they're going through a maladaptation it's maybe not intentional maybe intentional but that seems to be how cancer starts from what you're saying but what do you think yes you're absolutely right it's latent in every cell every cell is 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 a wannabe cancer because that's basically how life was done in the pre-multicellular stage it's it's cancer arises in almost every tissue i mean there are one or two Strange exceptions, as I'm told, no known cancer of the eyelid, at least in humans, and no known cancer of the vas deferens. But pretty much every other organ can give rise to cancer. One of the big unknowns is why some organs are more susceptible than others. There's some sort of obvious answers, yeah. like the gut, for example, is getting damaged all the time by the stuff going through. And so it's no surprise that colon can uh, occur. Right, but cancers have a tropism, it seems like, for metastases. Why do you think that is? Yes, yeah, so this intrigued me greatly because when we embarked on this, these uh, centers for physical oncology, the challenges it was expressed to us by Dr. Barker is that when you look at the statistics, primary tumors are responsible only for a small number of deaths. Now, almost all cancer fatality is caused by metastasis. The cells outgrow their organ of origin, they spread around the body, they colonize remote, remote organs, and at that stage, the outlook is not very good. And so if there was some way of saying, okay, well, we'll live with primary tumors, because you can always cut them out, but if we could just stop or slow the metastatic growth, we'd be onto a winner. And so there was a lot of thought given to could you change the physical properties of the vasculature, for example, to stymie the journey that these cells embark on? And it is an extraordinary story. I must admit, I, um, I came at this thinking, well, cancer is just a nasty thing you want to get rid of. And I just became amazed because these cells, will they seem to know what they're doing. They leave the primary tumor sometimes uh, in, in a, a group. I mean, they'll sort of march off together, but they have to work their way into the bloodstream. Some of them spread through the lymph system, but mostly through the, the bloodstream, which is a horrendous thing. They've got to sort of batter their way through. And then they're in this raging torrent being swept around the body. And then they've got to get out again. And they have uh, little hooks uh, on their surfaces. And we spend a lot of time studying the, the physics of the hooks. And they cling on to the sides of the by this stage with the capillaries, and then they have to batter their way through into the tissues beyond. And even when they get there, that's hostile territory. They've got to sort of set up home in a place where they don't belong and have to switch off or ignore all of the signals from the surrounding tissue that tells them to go away or to, to die. Really complex, hazardous, multi-stage process. And I, the very first question I asked is, do they know where they're going? Uh, they, this seems like a highly organized, pre-programmed response. Uh, is there a, you know, a tissue, a destination tissue? And it's true. 
that certain cancers, like prostate cancer, likes to metastasize to the brain, for example. And uh, sometimes it looks like, oh, these are just organs that are downstream of the primary tumor. But sometimes it, it seems like they really have got uh, a preferred organ that they want to set up home in. And there's a very ancient idea called the seed, seed and soil hypothesis. Uh, it goes back over 100 years. Uh, the idea being that uh, the metastatic cells uh, take root in uh, what is uh, re regarded as the appropriate soil for them. And there was even some evidence that somehow the primary tumor prepares the ground ahead of time. All sorts of chemical signals going back and forth around the body. It all looks very systematic. When I learned about all this, I thought, well, this, this is like uh, pre-programmed. This isn't just sort of random activity, organized activity. And the cancer is not just a lot of things gone wrong. It's a, a very carefully worked out and very ancient plan of action when cells feel that they're stressed, they're in a bad place and need to do something. So that was my take on it, and it remains that way. Has anyone, to your knowledge, uh, looked 3D spatially at a tumor and mapped the heterogeneity, you know, again, spatially, radially outwards from the center, and seen if you can then recapitulate the, the development of a tumor and what, what mutations come from which? Uh, well, it's interesting you should ask that question, because Robert Austin at Princeton University, who was my counterpart there, of the Physical Science and the Oncology Center, uh, applied for a research grant to, to do exactly that. He wanted to do, um, just like we were talking about the Grand Canyon, uh, geologists will drill a core down into the rock, and then they get the rock strata and they sort of see how things have changed over time. He wanted to basically drill into a, a tumor and do the equivalent sectioning and see how it's all put together. That, uh, that also didn't get funded. At that time, people were less aware of this thing called phyllospathography, uh, but it would uh, certainly be a very good idea to ask whether the cells at the center of a tumor have, are expressing genes of a different age than those on, on the periphery. These are all the sorts of things that we like to think about because with this tool of phyllospathography, you, you can ask uh, all the time, well, you, you have this or that property, can cancer, I should mention, uh, you think, well, how do you, how do you define it? There are about a dozen so-called hormones. cancer. Uh, and we've mentioned a few. One of these is uh, the uh, rapid proliferation of cells. The other is spreading around the body. And the other is turning off apoptosis and so on. And you can enumerate these. And then you can look at how old are the genes that control those various hormones. And uh, in the hypothesis we've developed, which is cancer as a sort of throwback, uh, we think it's more than just you know, one great leap. It's a systematic sliding backward, whereby the uh, more recently evolved genes are the ones that are activated first or, or reawakened first, and the, the more ancient ones later on. And so we would like to, to test that. It's, it's theory at the moment. We don't have the, the data for that, but we would like to test to see whether it, it, uh, it develops that way. So as cancer becomes more and more aggressive, later and later stages of cancer progression and so on. We think it expresses earlier and earlier genes. And there's one bit of evidence for that already, which comes from David Good and Anna Trigos at, in Melbourne, in Australia, the Peter McCallum Cancer Research Center. And they've looked at uh, prostate cancer. There's something called the Gleason score, which is a score of the aggressiveness of prostate cancer. And they've looked at the genes there uh, that are being expressed. And uh, sure enough, the more aggressive, the higher the Gleason score, the older the genes being expressed. So that um, sort of fits in with the idea that it isn't just a great leap backwards. It is a sy systematic turning on of older and older genes. And as cancer progresses, it, it's the older genes which are being more expressed. And the younger ones, the more recently evolved ones, being suppressed. So the tumor suppressor genes, for example, um, which evolved more recently, these have evolved to deal with tumors, uh, they get turned off first. That, that's our theory. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you, right, you know, when, when cancers arise, what are the first abilities that get turned on or what are the first genes that become altered? Do you know? And what are they? What, what does that tell you? Uh, well, my guess, I don't know the exact on that, but my guess is it's this um, uncontrolled proliferation is really where it all starts. But I think we're back with this problem that 
you only notice the candles when they start presenting clinical symptoms and then you're going to try to sort of retro dip you know what was it doing last year or three years ago or something like that so it's it's possible uh, that there are a sequence of precursory changes. There, there are one or two cancers where you can get a handle on that. For example, cancer of the esophagus uh, is um, it's a very nasty cancer, but it's often preceded by a condition known as Barrett's esophagus. We had a research program on it at ASU. And um, so what you see is that, as you, you may be aware, these conditions arise because of acid reflux. It's a very common condition. Uh, and ever get this, you, you get this sort of burning feeling in your esophagus because acid food's coming up from the stomach and that wounds the cells at the base of the esophagus. And after a while, if people suffer from this, those cells begin to undergo changes that are quite visible in a microscope. And in a small fraction of people who uh, suffer from Barrett's esophagus, they, they become cancerous. So it's almost as if there's a sort of sequence of, uh, of damage, of changes in structure. And so you can sort of study that. But, but mostly, particularly, that's because you can study because it's on the surface of a tube, the esophagus. But for cancers that are buried uh, deep in tissue, it's really very hard to know. But we will predict, according to the ages of the genes, when you look at the hallmarks, figure out the ages of the genes that represent them. And our hypothesis that the younger ones, the more recently evolved ones, are the ones that are manifested first in cancer progression. That has yet to be tested. We have suggested ways in which we might be able to test them. So again, going back to looking at a tumor in 3D spatially and looking at the heterogeneity, I would think that if you can't trace back all the mutations and, and, and everything back to like an original set or a very few ones that started, that would tell you that in general, it's, it's some kind of stress, metabolic stress, whatever it is that's causing these cells to revert to old gene pathways. But maybe it wouldn't tell you that. I don't know. Like what, like, what would it tell you if you, again, if you did a 3D model and you did see that everything had a common origin versus you didn't see that? You saw many, many different, you know, cells that were so different they could not have come from one cell. Well, so what you're suggesting is that you might have uh, a tissue which has tumors, but of multiple origin. In other right. words, it's, right. it's, uh, the tissue environment is a bad one. And all over the place, uh, there are uh, cells which are turning into cancer in response to that. And then it all joins in a sort of uh, horrible mess and you get one tangle. Uh, th this seems entirely plausible because cancer is so common that it would be foolish to suppose that if you've got a, an organ in which cancer develops, so the, the obviously would be foolish to suppose this couldn't happen more than once. If the conditions are right for cancer, you would expect uh, that there would be be many. And I don't know of any studies in which anyone has attempted to untangle whether, I mean, you can certainly determine a tissue of origin, but whether you can determine a position within that tissue or whether you're dealing with a, you know, a clonal population that they're always the same clone or whether you've got intermingled clones. It's a very good question. And somebody may know the answer to that, but I'm afraid it's not. I guess it's, you know, it's not at all clear. That's, that's part of the problem. So also, too, there's the issue of, again, what, what percentage of cells in a tissue that are cancerous have become cancerous because they've been co-opted, just like, you know, the seed and soil right. hypothesis says with metastases versus arising, I guess, de novo from tissue or microenvironment conditions. Can that be characterized as well? It certainly is the case that healthy cells get recruited or co-opted. The uh, particularly striking example what are called tumor-associated macrophage, TAN. Uh, and these are cells that are part of the immune response and would normally be going in to solve the problem. And they get sort of um, co converted, co-opted by the cancer and turn into part of the problem instead of part of the solution. One of the things that hallmarks of cancer is they can screen out the immune system. And, uh, and they do this with a variety of tricks, including basically um, turning the loyalty of a lot of the cells that are involved in, in attacking the cancer. It becomes part of their defense mechanism. If, if someone gets chemo um, and a tumor retreats and then it, it builds back up again, do you think that previously healthy cells have turned cancerous and that's the predominant source of the new tumor material? Or do you think it's existing cancer cells that survived and now, again, we're forced into yet another deeper regime of, of maladaptation. And those are the, 
you know, what the cancer is now comprised of when it comes back. Right. It, it's clearly both. Um, I, I, I know people who uh, have acquired, if you like, secondary cancers as a res- result of chemo from the first cancer. Uh, and th- this certainly happens because chemotherapy is, uh, you know, a very violent uh, thing to do to the body. And uh, so is radiation therapy. So, uh, base- and so is surgery. And so all of the ways of trying to attack cancer, the traditional ways, have the effect of uh, creating a risk for generating their own cancer. Um, in, in any particular case, so if you come at a tumour with, say, radiation and, uh, well, let's say take chemo, it's probably better, and the tumour shrivels down, and then you've got a sort of uh, refractory core of stubborn cells that are not going to succumb in, in that way. And then uh, it sort of bursts out again. Uh, how many, how much of that population in that new round, new cancers that have been generated, how many are just from the original? And again, I don't know the answer to that. These are good questions and things which could certainly be investigated. But there is no doubt that uh, the standard uh, methods of treatment carry a risk of that sort and they carry another risk which we which came out of this um, work I was talking about this SOS response bacteria the homologs of those genes which are being expressed in cancer that is cancer cells what this suggests to us uh, in terms of therapy is that highly aggressive chemotherapy is counterproductive because it basically triggers this SOS response in other words it is encouraging the cancer cells which are under attack to turn up their mutation rate to try to evolve resistance to the to the uh, chemicals. And of course, we know they do that. We know uh, resistance does evolve. You have to use different chemicals and another lot and another lot. And you're sort of fighting a rearguard action all the time. Um, and so we think uh, a more nuanced, uh, I'm not saying don't treat, but a more nuanced approach in which you don't do this really aggressive therapy because that just triggers this, as it were, hysterical SOS response. Uh, from the cancer cells, and you just make matters worse. That something which uh, aims to uh, keep the cancer in check to maintain an equilibrium rather than uh, go for total annihilation. And this becomes a rather political and psychological matter because I think many people have such a dread of cancer that if they're diagnosed with it, uh, they want nothing more than to have every last cancer cell eliminated from their bodies, uh, even if it takes them to death's door to do that. Um, and, and I think a lot of people feel that way. But if um, if people could be could learn to uh, understand that we're probably all living with cancer, as I was talking about earlier, microtumors, and it's part of the aging process, they're going to be in there. Our bodies deal with them perfectly satisfactorily. Uh, and maybe you've got one that the body can't really cope with and it needs help, and the help would simply be let's try to stabilize that, uh, that tumor or neoplasm as uh, the new population new cells is called. Uh, let's stabilize the neoplasm, prevent it uh, from pro- proliferating any further, but we don't go for total annihilation. We learn to live with it rather than uh, get, get, it, to get rid of it totally. And then you're in the same situation as you are with things like uh, diabetes. You control it, uh, you um, uh, try to extend life expectancy, uh, you never really get rid of it totally. And I, I think we'd have much more success with, with cancer treatment if it could be carried out in that in that spirit. And if we got better at it, if you could say to somebody uh, who's diagnosed with cancer, well, you know, we can we can aggressively treat this cancer, but there's a 50-50 chance it will come back five years. I mean, that's what would be very typical. If you say, well, you know, we won't uh, aggressively treat it, we'll try to stabilize it, we'll uh, hold off on it. And there's a 50-50 chance it will get out of control in 20 years. You know, then I think most people will feel, well, I've got other things to worry about. If you're in your 70s and you're told, well, it may be a problem in 20 years' time. And so that's a, a different approach to therapy. But it's also, I think, a different approach to public health, to human psychology, and and the way we treat cancer versus the way we treat other non-communicable diseases. If I look at, has, or has anyone done an autopsy, they've um, taken out a primary tumor and a bunch of metastases and sequenced all of them and looked for the differences in the heterogeneity and the mutations and, you know, primary versus metastases. And if so, what was found? Oh, uh, people certainly do this. This is a pretty standard line of inquiry. Uh, you don't have to do autopsies. You can do it on your living patients. Take biopsy samples from the primary tumor and the secondaries and so on. And uh, you sequence all that. 
the problem I would say quite generally, although that's a great way of thinking, the problem quite generally with gene sequencing uh, is that the uh, cancer research community has become rather enthralled of it. And that's because, uh, of course, it's, you know, it's this wonder toy that you can uh, get a sequence. And the great thing about a sequence is you've got some sort of solid thing that you can publish. There it is. You know, it's actual data. It's not just airy fairy concept. And so uh, they, they love to do all that. But the difficulty is get, cancers are so heterogeneous. Uh, you very often get, uh, you know, really complicated mess of different um, different mutations or different transcriptomes g- gene expression. And often it's rather sort of low-grade curve fitting. You can sort of come up with some idea, more or less. It, it's a little bit like looking at shapes in tea leaves. I've compared it to that. There are shapes in patterns of tea leaves, but they don't mean anything. And I think I got very cynical. Uh, having sat through uh, lecture after lecture after lecture of people sharing gene sequencing data and, and drawing conclusions from this sort of mess and thinking, well, it's a bottomless pit of comp- and you could go on sequencing forever and never really get down to the root cause of this. And that's why I wanted to develop a simpler understanding of, of cancer initiation progression based not on you know any individual case with uh, all of this complexity, but based on a sort of systematic way in which certain genes uh, are expressed and others are switched off. It's very much my approach. Well, here's yeah. the reason I ask is that, I guess, metastases are not composed of the tissue in which they reside. They're composed of the primary tumor tissue, right? So if I have liver cancer and a spot appears in my lung, it's going to be liver cancer cells there, not lung yes. cancer cells. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So I would expect now then there's not going to be co-option of the liver cells, I mean, sorry, there's not going to be co-option of the, you know, the lung cells now that the liver, the liver cancer cells have lodged themselves there. So growth only comes from meiosis, you know, from the splitting and dividing of the existing cancer cells that are there and not from, again, co-option of the adjacent tissue. And I would also suspect too, like the microenvironment is very different now. There may be a localized microbiome that's very different that, you know, has different metabolites that it would trade with those cancer cells the immunity component I would think would be heightened because now, again, the, the, the metastatic cells are in a very foreign environment. They're in a different tissue type, cell type. So I would think that the strategies employed would be very different and that would force a different but maybe discernible set of mutations that don't occur in primary because of right, this is a, Yes, yeah, the, you're raising a really excellent question, which is um, the natural history, so to speak, of a primary tumor and the metastatic tumor in tissue should be quite different. I can imagine still things like the tumor-associated macrophages, which move around the body, uh, that that story might be very much the same. But uh, you're quite right. I would not expect a, a liver a cancer cell lodged in the lung to be co-opting a neighboring lung cell. I would expect it to be turning off all sorts of signals from that lung microenvironment, which uh, basically um, would uh, if you put a healthy liver cell in your lung, it uh, doesn't do very well. And it uh, gets signals, chemical signals, telling it to undergo apoptosis. Um, all that gets turned off. But I would, you're quite right that if it's basically uh, following a, a pre-programmed response, if it's in this foreign tissue, it may well express the hallmarks of cancer in a different sequence from the primary tissue. And that's not something that that we have particularly looked at, but it seems like a very good suggestion, that, that comparison. Does anyone know if certain metastases arrive first and then others and then others? Is there any sense of hierarchy or even between primary and metastases? Is there a hierarchy where the primary is like the brain and the metastases, you know, communicate with the brain and follow its wishes? Well, I've seen people speculating uh, on that basis that there's a sort of an, a communication network uh, going, going on around the body between the primary tumor and the metastatic tumors. And I've even uh, one of the uh, groups in these physical science oncology centers even suggested that maybe we have it all back to front and that the metastatic story comes first and, and there's a sort of clustering into what you interpret to be the primary chip. That's a bit of an extreme example. But um, during a lecture in which it was claimed that there is this sort of uh, systemic organization and control, I suggested that what we needed uh, was the equivalent of the electromagnetic pulse in nuclear warfare. You know, you detonate a hydrogen bomb and it knocks out all of the 
electronics. And what we would really like is to you know, detonate something that would knock out that communication network around the body if we knew what it was. Of course, we don't. Uh, it's going to be chemical signaling of some sort, almost certainly, rather than uh, electrical. But, um, but we, don't, we don't know enough about it. But everything I learn about cancer suggests to me uh, that it is not just some sort of haphazard thing, that it really is systematic and organized. And when you're dealing with an organized enemy, I suppose we should say that, something like uh, attacking the command and control structure seems like a, a very good strategy. And then you might find that the different components sort of naturally wither away. And so these were all the types of thinking that uh, the physical scientists were bringing to bear. Uh, in this uh, research program. I think it's a, a really very enlightened approach to bring in scientists from other disciplines who think about problems in a totally different way. Yeah, no, I agree. I have surgeons try to resect just the primary tumor and left metastases alone, either by choice or by necessity. And, you know, what does that look like going forward? Like, um, I guess, I don't know if there's been a case where a person has not been treated with chemo, but just surgery. And again, they've removed the primary, but left metastases. And you know, what happens to that person? Do the metastases now all of a sudden go into hyperdrive because they've lost the communication signal and they're they really afraid and they're even crazier way or what happens? Yeah, no, they do. There certainly are uh, documented cases uh, where you get a sort of metastatic explosion. You think, well, you'd be better off leaving the primary tumor in check because somehow, you know, there was a, a system in place. And if we can have another one of these military analogies it's almost like um well you know the uh, mission control or the command and control center had uh, sent all these uh, special forces out into the field and then suddenly you know it all went quiet from mission control and so the special forces thought well we're just sort of taking on ourselves and well you know fight like hell where we are it's it's almost as if that uh, sort of thing is happening because you have to be very careful not to anthropomorphize this too much it almost is it It's almost as if cancer has a life of its own and a mind of its own. And it does seem in some cases to be sort of uncanny, uh, particularly the way in which it outwits the best efforts that physicians uh, deploy in order to concentrate it. Um, It it looks like you are dealing with a a very wily enemy. But of course, I don't think uh, we should go too far uh, with that metaphor because uh, we are just dealing with populations of cooperating cells. I, I really appreciate you coming and giving this very, very different perspective. What's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? Well, now that's interesting because there's quite a long publication list. And uh, probably the best thing is not the Beyond Center website, but there's a, another website specifically for this cancer research. And it's called, I can just give you the web address. It's uh, cancer, it's all lowercase cancer, then a dash insights, that's I-N-I-G-H-T-S, cancer uh, dash insights, uh, at asu.edu. And a lot of um, what is on that website that is sort of current has to do with um, cancer across species and different things of that sort. But it's a record of all these earlier things that we've been talking about should be there as well. So that's a good place to start. Um, okay. there's, there's also a section in my book, uh, the, the Demon in the Machine, on on cancer. How does that fit the story? Of, uh, oh, excellent. Of, okay. You know. Excellent. Well, Paul, thanks for coming back. It's it's uh, twice now. Great to talk to you both times. So thank you very well, much. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you, uh, Richard, and uh, thank you for your interest in this. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.